Okay. Now that the slides are up and the microphone's working. Thank you to the uh, for the to the chair for the nice introduction. I'd like to talk about the independent role of softening and reduc reduced ductility in the uh, fracture of steel. This work was done uh, primarily by my colleague Ali Asghari, who was brave enough to let me submit the abstract before he even started. And he started uh, a month and a half ago. This is on a brand new project. Uh, the project is a, is a massive project, uh, 25 million, uh, but it's looking at all aspects of what is necessary, what uh, technology is necessary for hydrogen to be used in ship propulsion. And so there are uh, work packages on, for example, electrolyzers, propulsion systems, all, all of this thing. We find ourselves in the safety one, and underneath the safety one, there are, TNO is doing uh, crash calculations, and under that, TU Delft is doing material assessment in order to advise on what kind of failure strain to use in the crash calculations. Therefore, we're looking at it from a very different perspective than uh, I think everybody else that I've seen here. Um, we're looking at really from the big scale. And so the motivation, we know that hydrogen affects the strength of materials, it affects the ductility, it affects, uh, for example, it can soften the material. And from the engineering uh, perspective, when we zoom out in the continuum perspective, we know that all of these things interact uh, for example, softening can induce uh, localization, which induce, which can in, in turn induce a reduced uh, engineering failure strain. And so then there's this coupling between the softening. You know, it, all of these things that we know that hydrogen affect, affect each other in the end engineering failure strain that we might experience on a structural level. In order to demonstrate that, I asked uh, Mr. Asghari to perform a simulation of a tensile test with a number of different uh, material models. And frankly, these material models aren't all that different, and none of them actually soften. The, the lowest one is perfectly plastic at some point. And then we have various different levels of hardening. And notably, there is no damage in this model. There's no uh, softening, there's no damage, there's no fracture strain. And yet, when we run the simulation of the tension test, we get force to, well, engineering stress strain curves that look like this, and we get evidently um, a various different ductilities. And so the question is, what is the relative role in to do this? Now, to answer that, we turn to some existing experimental data that was done by, uh, at the time he was a master's student, Tim Boat, um, but now he's a PhD working on hydrogen effects we turn to this experimental data that was on the shelf. This data is actually for a pipeline steel. And um, what, what Tim did is that he took an axisymmetric specimen that was hollow. And the hollow, it's a, just a four millimeter diameter hole that's drilled throughout the, uh, the specimen. And it's, it's exposed to tension. Here's the experimental setup. And a very nice thing about the experimental setup is that we have valves everywhere so we can load it with hydrogen or nitrogen and then close those valves. And then we have a very small amount of compressed hydrogen in the experimental setup. So when the specimen eventually does break, then the volume of, of released hydrogen is small enough not to really form a hazard. So we did this experiment, and um, there are a few pros and cons of this experiment. The first one, I the, the first real pro is that we can add in pressure in this, uh, in this volume that's representative of realistic pipeline steels. I know that today I'm not interested in pipeline steels, but that was Tim's motivation. Um, and I don't know if you count it as a pro or a con, but what we do have also is a, uh, is a gradient of hydrogen concentration through the thickness so that it has the highest concentration on the pressurized hydrogen side and uh, air on the other side. So what we can expect, and uh, th this should be no surprise, is that there is indeed a reduction in the true stress to failure due to the hydrogen itself. And I'm really sorry that this isn't visible here. It's, it's visible. 
it's, it's visible on my computer, but uh, I, I don't think that we're going to mess with the lights right now. Oh, right. But I can explain what should be on the screen. <laughs> is that uh, here we have, a, uh, we have the actual hole uh, that we drilled out for the hydrogen. Oh. I assume that I'm not the only one who has uh, fractogra uh, fractography here. <laughs> oh. <laughs> it doesn't help, does it? <laughs> well, I, I can explain it, and I think, uh, I think that most people here will understand. Okay. Let's start on. No problem. <laughs> On the edge, oh, this is much nicer, yes. Yeah, thank you. So on the inside edge, what we get is a uh, brittle uh, trans uh, transgranular quasi-cleavage type mode. And then as we go to the outside edge, we can see, uh, well, on the, macro, on the macro scale, but also on the micro scale, we can see, yeah, the dimpling type behavior that we would expect for void nucleation growth and coalescence. And so we can expect that there's a transition. The reason that I think that this is an advantage is that when I eventually post-process it, perhaps a bit better, we might actually be able to figure out at what hydrogen concentration it changes mode, but uh, that, that's for the future. So how do we interpret this? We have a forced displacement curve from the experiment. We hypothesize a true stress strain curve, substitute that into a finite element uh, model, post-process post the finite element as if it's an experiment, compare that to the experiment, and then iterate until it works. This is a fairly common uh, procedure that I think should be recognizable to anybody who's done damage mechanics calculations. In our case, this, uh, this iterative process was done through a op optimization algorithm. You can see the, ex the, uh, the details on the FEA, but that's not very interesting. The solution is that we did, in fact, get a very good correlation between the simulation and the experiments. That should happen uh, by the very nature of inverse engineering. What disappoints me is, in fact, this good correlation was achieved with exactly the same true stress strain curve for both the nitrogen-loaded and the hydrogen-loaded experiments. So at least uh, for this experiment, we can say that all of the reduction in ductility was in fact due to a reduction in the local failure strain, or in the case that you're talking about qu uh, transgranular quasi-cleavage, that there was a uh, imposed uh, fracture stress um, in the hydrogen-loaded specimen. The conclusions that I have is that for this experiment, and I put that italic, for this experiment, the ductility appears to be completely uh, due to the damage caused by the, ha the, the, the hydrogen, so a reduction in failure strain. However, I am not ready to give any conclusions yet in a more general sense because we know that there are other materials, other hydrogen concentrations, other stress triaxialities present uh, in various different applications. Why this is important is that when I'm considering modeling something like a ship that's exposed to crash, in which it has fuel systems that are, for example, hydrogen loaded. Um, in a way, this does make it slightly easier because this allows me to focus my concentration for modeling hydrogen effects really on the reduction in ductility, at least for this material, and not so much on the plasticity. I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I invite any questions.